My name is Ted Hodges. Today I will interview William H. Johnson, a veteran of World War II. This interview is a part of the Veterans Oral History Project. The interview is being conducted in the Riley County Office Building, located at 115 North 4th Street in Manhattan, Kansas. The camera operator for the recording is Joseph Chapes. Today's date is August the 19th, 2003. And Bill, to get into the interview, could you start by giving us your name, your rank, your serial number, your branch of service? William H. Johnson, and final rank was Captain, uh, Corps of Engineers, and the, uh, the uh, serial number was 0544131. Okay. Uh, do you remember, Bill, where you were on December the 7th, 1941? when you heard the news about the Pearl Harbor attack? You know I do, and I suppose most of us do, but uh, I was at Ohio State University at the time as a student, and like most good students at that time, I had to earn some money of my own. So I was working in the uh, main library at Ohio State reselling books, and someone came through the hall at that time and sang that Pearl Harbor had been bombed, and that was quite a shock to me at that time. Can you uh, recall uh, what you're really, you, you were shocked, but what were your feelings? Could you plan what might happen to you in the future? I think that's what caused me to think about the future, perhaps, mm -hmm. and make some plans of my own relative to, well, I guess what I thought at that time was very likely be military service. Mm -hmm. uh, which branch of the service did you say you were in? Well, I was in... Uh, ROTC at Ohio State, and as I said, after Pearl Harbor, I sort of had a hunch things were going to happen and I needed to make some plans of my own. Mm -hmm. So I enrolled in advanced ROTC at that time, and that was the Corps of Engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in the engineering college at that time, and I could qualify for the Corps of Engineers, and that's what I wanted. Let's go back uh, to prior to your military service. Tell us something about where you were born and, and your childhood and, and reaching into your college experience at Ohio State. Well, I was born on a farm, <clears throat> Shelby County, Ohio, which is in the western part of the state. And uh, I worked uh, on the farm until I probably was a uh, sophomore in college. And uh, I had, in high school, I had taken agriculture and in that in that particular curriculum we we visited Ohio State University quite often so I knew the campus well and then in addition I managed to get a scholarship which helped induce me to to go to college <clears throat> so I did enter Ohio State University in the fall of 1940 and then the uh, process of getting into the military could you Tell us what you went through. I think you uh, went, You said you were back in ROTC and something happened. Well, I did enroll in advanced ROTC, but I only got one year. And then, so as juniors, we were pulled out, a group of us were, were pulled out of Ohio State University and sent to uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri for basic training for the, for the Corps of Engineers. So, so that was... My early experience, anyway, was uh, uh, didn't the only thing that advanced ROTC did for me was to give me a, a crack or a uh, a possibility of getting to OCS. Okay. Uh, just in <clears throat> general sense, then we'll get into some specifics here. But were you an officer or were you, were you an enlisted man when you went into the service? Well, when I was in uh, basic training, of course, which was at Fort Leonard Wood, I was a PFC, I think. Okay. So I was not an officer until I went through OCS sometime later. Uh, again, in a general sense, did you serve overseas? And if you did, in what theater were you? I did serve overseas uh, in the ETO, European Theater, mm -hmm. and then was transferred to the Pacific. So I served in both theaters. Could you uh, tell us something about your early military service, uh, what your first assignment was, and that sort of thing? You mean after our, after I got out of... After you were out of basic training. Oh, okay. Out, out of basic training, 
there were no openings in OCS at that time. So they sent us back, believe it or not, to Ohio State University and the group of us enrolled back in the College of Engineering and we got one more quarter as a result of waiting for openings into OCS. Then in December of 1943, uh, I, was, uh, I got the opportunity to go to OCS and this was Fort Belvoir, Virginia. And I remember I went in a day late and because of that uh, I was all by myself and on a train from Washington to some place, I don't know, but it went through Akatink. And Akatink was a rail station for Fort, Fort Belvoir. And I was to get off there. But the con missed me some way, and the train started on, and I immediately got busy, and he pulled the emergency cord, and I got off the train right in the middle of the tracks at Akatink, or close to Akatink. I, I don't remember how I got back to the fort. It was had been reasonably close. I presume I walked. But I don't remember this well, but I can remember approaching an officer, or an officer approached me as I came on the, uh, on the fort. He was standing just a bit to my right. So he walked up to me and he says, do a half left. I instinctively went to the right. <laughs> well, that was my first chewing I got from attack officer at, o at, o at OCS. Uh, in the... Uh OCS, what was that, a 90-day program, something like that? 120 day, 120. Four, four months. Were there any experiences you had there that really stand out in your mind? Was it a pretty uh, hard well, experience? Well, it was an interesting experience, and I don't know why, <clears throat> but I got along very well in OCS. Uh, I had no great problems. They had what they called a, you could be called up on review, and that meant that you were reviewed as to whether you could remain in OCS or not. And then I was never called up for review. But I remember, I do remember one incident. I was in command of the platoon that I was in, and we were marching to the mess hall. And somewhere or another, I got out of step with, with the platoon. And then we were approaching the mess hall from the side. So consequently, uh, the fellows in the lead of the platoon, they didn't know, they got no command from me, so they didn't know whether to turn into the mess hall or not, but fortunately they did not. They went on. And I gave them an about, or a, to the rear march, they came back. I started, we went into mess hall, and nothing ever occurred. I mean, I didn't hear a word about it. It was all right. What, was there a formal ceremony when you finished OCS? Was there a graduation type thing? There was a graduation and you got your bars pinned on you at that time. It was a great day. Yeah. And my wife, I think, and I was married at this time, she pinned the bars on me. Well, well tell us about uh, your getting married in there in, in this sequence. Somewhere along there that happened. Okay, we were uh, back at Ohio State after having gone through basic training. And uh, I had the opportunity to get married at that time, and we did. We were married in October the 2nd, 1943, and then in December, of course, I was in OCS. And my wife visited me a time or two at OCS, and I remember one time we had been out on, on I guess you call it maneuvers, we were building ponton, ponton bridges, and of course at that time they were manhandled pretty much, and. Uh, we had been out on training for some period of time, and we had to get these pontons deflated and back on trucks, and this was quite a, quite a task. But the point of it is, I was bushed at the time that uh, we got back into camp. And after that, uh, we had a three-day pass or some such thing, and I met my wife, we headed back into Washington to sleep. After you were settled into the military, your first assignment after OCS, what did you do there? I was assigned to Camp Maxey, Texas, which is close to Paris, Texas, and in the Corps of Engineers, I was still in the, well, I was in the Corps of Engineers. My first assignment was a, a combat engineering battalion, black troops. And I might say just a word about that, that uh, I served with these men for, uh, well, close to a year, I guess. 
and uh, I got along very well with the black troops. I think that I respected them, and I think they respected me. And consequently, we did very well. And when when uh, I left that uh, platoon, I had a tear in my eye. There was no special training that you got, was there, that had to do with leading a particular black crew? No, no. We were uh, treated just like anyone else as far as the Army was concerned. But, of course, at that time, the black troops were segregated from the, uh, from the white troops. We did have white officers. We had uh, the whole cadre of officers was white. Uh, well, we had one physician, I guess, that was black. But other than that, well, they were all white. And when you left this assignment, then that's when you were sent overseas? We left uh, uh, Camp Maxi in uh, October of 1943 again and uh, went to Camp Shanks just outside of New York in preparation for going overseas. And uh, we boarded a, a ship at New York, a General T.H. Bliss. It was a naval ship, as I remember. And uh, I can remember going through the North Atlantic anyway. It was pretty rough on, on board ship. And uh, I can remember sitting, I was duty officer, and I can remember sitting on what was a plastic floor of some kind, sitting in a chair. And when that ship would list, you'd, you'd slide over to one side of the wall, on one side of the room. The ship would list the other way, you'd, you'd list or you'd slide back the other way. So we had some pretty rough waters in the North Atlantic as we went over. Uh, on this assignment, just before you got on the ship, were you uh, in a unit at that time? Or were you going over as a replacement, or did you all go over as some sort of, a, of an organized unit? I was part of the 184th Engineering Combat Battalion at that time, and that was the black, uh, the black organization. Okay, this is the, the same group then that you were with in, in Paris. That's right. That's right. We went, we stayed, uh, I stayed with that group, went overseas with them. Uh, then when you uh, got off the ship, you uh, got off where? At Southampton, England. Okay. And we went some distance to Glastonbury Street, which is in southern England, and that's where we had our, our, uh, our billets, and uh, that's where we lived for a while. We didn't do much there. It was mostly physical training, I guess. Uh, I did have an opportunity to go to London on pass, though, and I saw some of the devastation of, of London. And, of course, the, uh, the blitz was going on at that time, or had gone on, and I was very much amazed at the de devastation in, in that city. But uh, at least I got to see that. Mm -hmm. uh, did you uh, get to experience while you were in... London, any of the reactions of the people of there, uh, of the English, what they'd been through? Well, they'd been through a lot, obviously, and uh, but uh, I think by and large those people were, you know, upbeat, mm -hmm. and uh, they seemed to uh, have confidence that ultimately this whole thing was going to turn out uh, right for them. So I think they were pretty, uh, pretty proud people. Th then after this, you uh, went into. Uh, which European country? We went into France, and we went from, again, we went to Southampton, got boarded an English ship, and went across the Channel on Christmas Day. Got to La Havre, France, and we got off ship there and walked 18 miles of full field pack to get to our campsite. Well, of course, our <clears throat> the equipment for the battalion uh, hadn't arrived yet. In fact, is I think it probably was a couple of weeks before the equipment arrived, so we had no kitchen. So we lived on spam, jam, and bread for those times, and I still don't like spam. Uh, could you uh, tell us then, after you got there, what were you in combat then? No, no, this was in La Havre, and that, that was, okay, to back up just a bit. The thing that stimulated our movement from England to France was the bulge. See, that was in December of 40, 44, well, no, yeah, December of 44. And uh, we were moved across the channel and up eventually into Luxembourg as a result of the bulge. But by the time we got there, the bulge was completely over, so we saw no direct action 
as a result of the bulge. But in La Harve, we were there probably for, three, I think, around three weeks, and we did maintenance on buildings, on the buildings on the, uh, on the sea coast or on the, uh, on the wharf there. We did re-roof a building there, and that was part of our responsibility as, as uh, engineers, of course, that we could do that kind of work. And then we boarded a train in La Harve, the 40 and 8, and you remember what that was. It was a boxcar, and it hold either eight horses or 40 men. Well, we got on the boxcars, and we uh, traveled through France on boxcar. We went through Paris, but I didn't see a thing of Paris because we were in the boxcar. And we got to uh, Luxembourg. That was our destination, was Mersch, Luxembourg. So the battalion, as a unit, went there. Then we were dispersed. And our responsibilities were, because of the bulge, they had road uh, guards placed. Uh, what's the right word, anyway? Anyway, they had uh, places to... Uh, checkpoints, maybe. Well, they were checkpoints, but all, also points of uh, anything, anything that happened. If the Germans came through or started to come through, of course, they'd come through these points first, and that would be the, the, the warning. So we had, we were... Uh, guarding or manning those uh, those points, or those uh, checkpoints. Uh, I believe you said that, that right after you got out of OCS that uh, you had your commission as a second lieutenant. Somewhere in this process you got promoted to first lieutenant and, I and did, then to captain. I did, but it, <clears throat> I didn't get my promotion until sometime later than where we're at right now anyway. Okay, I, I was jumping the gun here. Uh, the, uh, when we uh, were in Luxembourg, as I said, the, the, the company was split up, and my, my platoon was split up at various locations to these guard points. And uh, at that time, and I don't know how this happened, we, we were the headquarters unit of my platoon was uh, living with a Luxembourg family. And I remember their name, Joseph Welder, with these people's name. And they were in an old mill. They lived in a mill. And it was water. They had a water-powered generator in this mill, and so they could get the BBC. Well, the point is that uh, we could share food. We could get. We had certain rations that were, were given to us. Mm -hmm. And we'd share these with the people that we're living with, and we lived very well. And, and of course, we were in, warm, uh, in a warm house at this time. Another thing I remember very well is I got a terrible cold there. And this, uh, the lady the, of the house, she was pretty well determined she was going to cure my cold. Well, what was the medicine? It was honey, tea, and snops. Yeah. <laughs> Have you uh, had any contact with these people since that time? When we came back out of Germany, we came back and revisited the family again. And then in 1981, uh, a couple of families went over again, and we got to see the well. The the uh, the man and woman were both dead, but uh, we did see the remnants of the family, a niece and a nephew, and we got to visit with them. So yes, we got to see the family again. That was a good personal experience. Uh, do you recall any other things that you would like to tell us about personal experiences with the people there? Well, these, of course, uh, I had my jeep driver was a very active young man, a, an excellent driver. And he got to be quite uh, a pal with the grandson of the people that we lived with. And when we were back visiting, we asked this man, he, of course he was, he was growing up, we asked him if he remembered. Yes, he said, he remembered those experiences. So, you know, the relationships there were, were good. These people were quite outstanding in the fact that they had harbored or would harbor Luxembourg boys. And they tell some harrowing experiences about moving these boys from room to room ahead of the, of the German uh, soldiers or whoever was doing the check. And this would be, uh, I would think, be quite an experience to uh, have to do that kind of thing. You mentioned that you had food that you could share with the people that did you get, say, monthly or weekly a, a standard ration type thing? Did you get uh, 
cigarettes and beer and that sort of thing? We got cigarettes. I mean, we, didn't, we didn't get beer. We got cigarettes and liquor. But, uh, you know, uh, how we worked that, I don't know. I have no idea where the food came from. I suppose it was, it was uh, somewhere or another rationed to us. And I think primarily what we got was meats. And, of course, those people didn't have meats at that time. So we would supply the meats and they the vegetables, and we uh, we did very well for a while. Not very long, but <laughs> for a while. How did you stay in touch with your family and friends back home? During, we didn't have the communications in that time like uh, we have now, but how did you stay in touch with your family? Well, I was married. And uh, so I wrote just about, I wrote home just about every day. So uh, now the letters were delayed many times. Maybe it might be that didn't get uh, there for a month or so, but uh, at least uh, my wife wrote back, and so we basically stayed in communication by, by letters. Email, you remember the email letters? Little square letters, and of course they were photographed, and, but I still have some of those in a file. Uh, in all of this experience, uh, did you form an opinion about what you thought the quality of the leadership was, and what was the quality of the military at that time? Well, I was quite pleased with the, uh, the leaders of this uh, 184th Engineering Combat Battalion. I think they were, uh, uh, we worked well together. Uh, we had a, a reasonable commanding officer, uh, lieutenant colonel. So I thought at least the people that I was direct contact with, I was quite pleased with, with these. Now, you know, uh, overall, I don't know whether I have an, much of an impression other than what the local, uh, what my local uh, uh, unit might have, might have been. Mm -hmm. uh, before we get into your after military experiences, are there any things that you can recall from the military type experience that you would like to relate to us? Well, I think the, the benefit that I got from, mil and by the way, as far as the military was concerned, it was a it was good experience for me. I felt I had good relationship with the platoon and also the officers of the of the battalion. And uh, so consequently, I, I, I feel that the managerial or, well, perhaps managerial responsibilities, and that's one thing about the Army, or the service, I should say, you get cer you get responsibility very quickly. One thing I missed way back when, when I first went to Camp Maxey, Texas, my first responsibility was to get a dead body back, sent back home. <laughs> well, <laughs> I didn't know what to do, but you know you have to do something, and so you do it. So you got it done. Got it done. Uh, do you remember uh, the details of being uh, separated from the service where it happened and when it happened? I was separated at Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. Uh, and that would have been about, uh, well, I guess the official date was September the 27th, 1946. So yeah, that was at Camp, at Camp McCoy. But there's other things that happened to us there. I'd like, kind of like to go back to the Luxembourg experience if we could. Please do that. Uh, my, my platoon was at, dispersed at different locations, but I would go out to review them or inspect them, whatever you want to call it, each day. Well, Luxembourg has some pretty hilly terrain, mountains, in fact. And uh, so I was on this mountain road one, one day with a Jeep driver, and uh, we were going to uh, inspect the, the guard positions. It was. It had snowed. It was, the the road was icy in the mountains, and and of course you have the hill and then the the valley, of course, and the road was on the on the on the side of the mountain. And uh, as any good jeep driver will do, he s reached down and flipped that jeep out of four wheel drive because it was icy. We immediately started to slide, and we started to slide toward the downhill side. But there was a tree there, small tree, probably three inches in diameter. So we came, we bounced off of that tree. It flipped us. We turned 360 degrees and, and proceeded down the slope of the, of the road and came to rest 
against the second tree, or that, and that would have that prevented us from going over the, the side of the mountain. So we were we were pleased, of course, that those trees were there, and but the jeep driver did what he should have done. But that was just the uh, road condition at that time. Just as a point of interest to me, was the uh, jeep still drivable after the incident? Oh yeah, it was okay. It didn't hurt. The, the first tree hit us just a little bit behind center. So, of course, it turned us this way, 360 degrees. The only thing I did, I lost my tin hat, centrifugal force in the process. Uh, somewhere in this process, we, I was early on uh, asking you about your promotions. Have any of these promotions occurred at this time? It probably occurred about this time. Okay. That's, about, that's about, that would have been about the time. Did this as a surprise to you? Or I had, I had, it? oh, I guess, yes, I probably was expecting it, but then it, it, uh, you know, I didn't have any inkling it was going to do. But we continued then from Luxembourg, we continued up through Belgium and Holland, and we were doing, as I said, we had to, had to guard, guard positions in Luxembourg. Then we started to do road work. And then the next assignment we had of all things, bearing dead animals. Uh, as any battle, any, any battle situation, of course, the animals are the, they are the victims too. And uh, of course, part of the people that were in the uh, in the uh, fighting at that time, they didn't do anything. So we had the response, and we had the equipment. Of course, we had the bulldozers and things like that, so we could bury those animals. But then, that was part of the responsibility we had: road work, and that, and. Uh, maintenance of buildings. We did very little bridge work. We did do some. I was the first one across the Rhine of our battalion. Uh, my platoon was the first one across the Rhine. We, we crossed the Rhine at Wesel, which is pretty far north. And our mission at that time was to go on the east side of the Rhine and uh, scan a field for mines. They were going to build a hospital over there, a field hospital there, and so it was our responsibility to make sure there were no mines in the area. And of course, there wasn't. Uh, was most of the road work uh, repair from war damage, or was it building new roads? It was not building new roads. It was a matter of maintaining what was there. Okay. And that's an interesting point, too. There was one time we had no access to gravel, so consequently our road work consisting of hauling hot, dry dirt on the road to absorb some of the moisture and keep the units moving this way. So it wasn't very sophisticated uh, road work, at, at, at least that we had to do. This was both for military use and for civilian use? No, this had been primarily for military use. Okay. But by the time we were through with that hauling dirt, that, that road had been built up a couple of feet, I expect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Bill, are there any other experiences from the European theater that you need to tell us, would like to tell us? We went uh, as far east as the Elbe River, and that's, that's uh, just about 50 miles west of Berlin. Uh, now exactly why we were ordered up there, I don't know, but we did get up that far. Not very long, we didn't stay very long, but we were in contact with a lot of the Russian troops at that time. And that was another interesting thing was that the, the Russian troops did not want, or I should say the uh, German troops did not want to uh, surrender to the Russian troops. They wanted to surrender to the American troops. So consequently, uh, most of the uh, German soldiers were coming back to the, uh, to the West, of course, at that time. And then, as I said, we were only up at the Elbe a very short period of time. We were then called back close to the Rhine. I, my notes uh, that I have said it was Linford, but I can't find Linford on the map, so I'm not sure I have that place right. But our responsibility then was to build stockades. And these uh, were barbed wire enclosures. I don't know, I'm, I'm afraid that I don't really remember the size of them particularly, but they were sizable. They'd hold probably 150,000 people. So they were they were large. And this was rather interesting too, that those prisoners were put in, and as I said, they were coming west at the time, so they were just a matter, they were there, they were ready to uh, get their arms, and so 
but they were they were contained, so to speak, in the in these enclosures. But they were provided food. They took care of it themselves. They governed themselves. As far as this enclosure is concerned, we had no contact. We had no responsibility toward them. They governed themselves, which I thought was rather important. There was always a good market for cigarettes and and uh, candy and that kind of thing with those people in those enclosures. The implication being that they had money to pay. They didn't have money. They'd have, you know, this is not very good to tell, I guess, but then they'd have watches and that kind of thing. I didn't do much of that, but there was a lot of uh, bartering like that went on for cigarettes and, and candy. Uh, then you came back to the States after this, and was there a period of time after you came back to the States before you were discharged? How long was it in there? Well, uh, I didn't get back to the States for a while. But you see, we were we were called back to uh, the the area close to the Rhine, and then we were sent to south toward Marseille, France, and that's the time when we went from Germany to Marseille, France. That's the time when we visited our Luxembourg family again. But we got to Marseille, France, to Arles was the name of the staging area, and there the unit, this 184th and Combat Engineering Battalion, was uh, was broken up. And uh, what happened to my platoon, I have no idea. But I was reassigned then at that time to the 1323rd Engineering General Service Regiment. <clears throat> and they were slated for the Japanese theater. So in Marseille, France, we got on board ship, the, the uh, SS Brazil. It was a, uh, should have been a, or was a passenger ship operating between New York and South America, but of course it was a troop ship at this time. So we got on the SS Brazil and went across the uh, Atlantic through the Panama Canal and got on the west side and uh, about, what was it, uh, August the 17th, I think, or something like that, the Japanese war ended. So as far as I was concerned, I was pleased that the atomic bomb fell at that time. But uh, but this was a nice, this was a good trip on this ship. We had good facilities. Uh, of course, at that time, I have to admit, I was an officer. I w was in what would have been uh, a stateroom. I wasn't down in the hold. And of course, the enlisted men, they traveled in the hold, and that wasn't particularly a nice place to be. Uh, after you went through the Panama Canal, then you went where? Uh, we were headed. We were headed for the Philippines. And since we were on the west side of the canal, we went on. Some of my buddies came in a little later, and of course they were on the east side of the Panama Canal, and they came in home. So we were just a few days off there, but it cost us, uh, cost me a whole year. I was a whole year getting back then from the, uh, from the Philippines after we went through the Panama Canal. And, and what were you doing in the Philippines during this waiting time? The, uh, as I said, we were... I was a member of the 1323rd Engineering General Service Regiment. Uh, we came into Manila. We were taken some way to Clark Field, awaiting the equipment. The equipment followed. And then we went to Lingayan Gulf, which is probably some 70 miles north of Manila. And there the unit, where, that's where we actually set up the, uh, the battalion, a regiment that was. And... Uh, but it turned out that the 1323rd Regiment also was a high point unit. Now, why they were moved from uh, the ETO to the, Philipp uh, the, the, to the Philippines, I don't know. But they were. They were moved. And uh, so we were there. We arrived in Manila, uh, I'm going to say in August of 1945. And uh, we were in the process of getting these people sent home. Since they were high point, why well, they weren't in, and of course the Japanese war had ended by that, by that time, so there was no purpose for them. So they were, they were sent home. And uh, of course that left me then in the process of doing paperwork in an effort to get these people sent home. So you did that until what time then? December of 40, December of 45, 1945. And then I was reassigned to the General Engineering District, G, uh, uh, 
General Engineering District. That's what it was called. GENED. G-E-N-E-D is what we called it. This was located in Manila. So I was transferred from Lingayan Gulf, which was north, to, the, uh, to, to Manila. And there, the General Engineering District was responsible for Army engineering construction in and around Manila. And I was in the supply section of all things. I was in the supply section, and we're, our job was to watch the ship manifests as they were coming into Manila, trying to determine if there was any engineering equipment on board ship that we should have responsibility for or claim. So I spent a lot of time traveling <clears throat> uh, around Manila to the wharf, to the ships as they came in. I, we didn't move anything. All we did was carry the paperwork. But uh, that was our responsibility. We had some good people working for us, Filipinos working for us. And I had a group, I had a section of, I guess, myself and a, 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 an enlisted assistant and then four secretaries or bookkeepers, whatever you might call them there. And they were great people. Then in December, then you uh, came back stateside. No, I spent... Uh, she went to Jeanette in, in December, and I stayed there about roughly six months, working for with them or for them. And then in uh, uh, July, June or July of 1946, it would have been, I got orders to come home. So, and that was from Manila. I came from Manila, and I came on board the Marine Fox. It was a troop ship, and... Uh, it was, I, as I remember, it was a converted tanker with very heavy superstructure in the stern of the ship. And of course, we came the what they called the Great Northern Route, and that took us all just off the coast of Japan with this uh, troop ship. And I can remember that old ship riding out of the water and just coming down, slapping the water. You know, you'd think it just shudder. You'd think that ship was going to break apart. Well, it didn't, obviously. And we made it back to. Uh, I think it took us probably 14 days to cross the Pacific, come back. We came in to Oakland <clears throat> under the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> then, then after you came in there, I'm sure that was an exciting time for you. But how long was it after that until you were actually separated from the service? Well, we would have come in, um, again, dates, uh, I'm not too clear, but... We would have come in to uh, Oakland probably in August of 1946. And then we went by train from Oakland to uh, Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. And by the way, somewhere or another, that train went north through the Royal Gorge. And I, I never understood just how we got from Oakland to that far south through the, through the Royal Gorge and headed toward uh, uh, Camp McCoy, Wisconsin, but we did. Another story, uh, of course I was married and I wanted to come home with a, a good head of hair. Uh, so I'd let my hair grow. I got in at Camp McCoy and I decided, well, I'll go get my hair cut and get a nice haircut. I got an old barber that kind of had the paws in. He started with the clippers and he started the back and by the time he got through, he was clear up in the, <laughs> the crown of my head. Well, obviously, I got a GI haircut, and that's what I came home with. And, but you still got a good reception when you got home. Well, we, we went through Chicago, of course, and I was traveling with another fellow from Columbus, Ohio. And uh, we decided we were going to have us a good steak dinner. So as I remember, it was a Blackstone Hotel, but that may not be right. I don't know. But we got in the hotel, and... We had a good steak dinner, and I think it cost us $10 a piece at that time, but we, we had it and came in then by train from there to uh, Columbus, Ohio, and that's where I re, uh, rejoined my wife at that, at that point. Uh, let's move now, uh, Bill, if we could, into your after-military service. Uh, you got home, and then... What was what did you do after you got home? Did you go back to school, or what happened then? Did you use the GI Bill? Uh, yes, uh, I got back as I said. I separated. <clears throat> the official separation date was September the twenty seventh, 
and I got back to uh, Columbus, Ohio <coughs> in time to start that fall semester back at Ohio State, which I did. GI Bill was a godsend. Too many of us that had uh, milit or, uh, educational experiences yet in front of us, the GI Bill, boy, it, uh, it did us up proud. And of course, I had a dependent, my wife at that time, so, and we did very well on that uh, the fina financially as far as the GI Bill is concerned. And I might say, maybe I shouldn't say, but within nine months after I got home, we had a son. <laughs> I was in school. I had, uh, see, I was in a five-year curriculum there at Ohio State, and I'd only gotten two years to start with, so I guess I had three years to go. And after you got your bachelor's degree in engineering there, then, then what did you do? I stayed on, and uh, see, I, at that time I was working for the Ohio Agricultural Experiment Station, mm -hmm. but located in Columbus. So I took some courses while I, there, and uh, then ultimately got my master's in 1953 in agricultural engineering. And at that time, you were probably an assistant professor. I was an assistant professor. That's right. And then you taught and did research at Ohio State. That's right. And uh, then let's see, about 1959, I guess it was went to uh, Michigan State for the Ph.D. And there I met the man that's doing the interviewing. That was a great time for us. Uh, after you got your Ph.D., you went back to Ohio State. Went back to Ohio State. Could you tell us then what followed after that in, in your uh, work career? Well, I let's see. That would have been 59, I guess. Yeah, 1959. And then... Ultimately, I had the opportunity to go to uh, Kansas State, to go to Kansas. And, uh, well, in the meantime, I'd taken a sabbatical. I went to Texas A&M for a sabbatical and I never went back to Ohio. And so, consequently, I uh, got the opportunity to go to Kansas State. And I think the bottom line is that was a great uh, move for me and a great experience to be a part of the Kansas State University. It, they gave me opportunities there that I would have had no place else, certainly not in Ohio. What were some of the things you did at Kansas State University, some of the positions that you held? Well, I, was, I went to Kansas State as head of the Department of Agricultural Engineering, and that would have been in 1970. And then in 1981, I gave up the headship and uh, was appointed to the director of the Engineering Experiment Station at that time. And I kept that position then until I retired in 1987. In that uh, job as uh, director of the Engineering Experiment Station, what were some of the things that you were responsible for? Well, of course, uh, a lot of the research monies that uh, the College of Engineering received was grants, contracts, and that kind of thing. So this Engineering Experiment Station had the responsibility of administering not only the state appropriated monies for research, but also assisting faculty in, in gaining contracts and uh, grants, and then administering those after the, they were won. Then you uh, retired when? 1987. And what have you done since then? Well, we've traveled a good bit. In fact, is, uh, as I indicated, we uh, went back to uh, uh, Europe in 19... 79 or 80, and retraced the steps that I had been, that I'd gone through in uh, Germany, France, and Belgium, Holland. And uh, this was a great experience for me because I got, there was one location, and I, I missed this, but uh, one location in Luxembourg, uh, we were replaced the uh, 17th Airborne uh, division, and we, but we had guard positions. There was no activity, no no fighting. It was just guard positions. But we hit the line at that time. The, this is the 184th Engineering Combat Battalion. Hit those, uh, hit the line, and uh, we had uh, 
we were living, we were built in an old bombed out building in the basement of this building, but the furnace was still functional. So we fired that old furnace up. Now, it was winter time, of course. We fired that old furnace up, and we, we stayed warm during that period. But uh, it's, uh, at that time, we could see the Germans across the Ur, OUR, the Ur River. And, uh, but uh, the only thing that we were subjected to was artillery fire. And we were subjected to rather heavy artillery fire. In fact, is one of the men in my platoon, one of the best men that I had in the, in the platoon, was on guard duty. And he heard a shell coming in, and he, but he turned his back to it. Instead of hitting the dirt, he turned his back to it, and he was killed as a result of that. So that was one of the you know, less desirable experiences that we had. Mm -hmm. uh, your living experiences since retirement, you've done lots of travel, and uh, where, where do you reside now? Uh, we reside at Medlark. Uh, it's a retirement facility, retirement home, and uh, we uh, we enjoy that very much. We do we do uh, enjoy travel. Uh, we've traveled, I think, the last count as I remember, including military, around 45 countries that we've been in. But uh, uh, as I said, we 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 enjoy travel, and I guess as long as we can do this will probably continue. My wife has macular degeneration now, so she doesn't see well, but uh, that's one of the uh, penalties, I guess, that uh, old age brings to us. But yes, we've enjoyed, in fact is, we had an RV for a little while after, uh, after I retired. And we had that, we had the RV six years and we put 66,000 miles on it, so we traveled in it a good bit. Uh, one thing I haven't asked you, Bill, I you had the uh, one son uh, in the appropriate time after you got back home, but uh, were there other children? We have three children. The son was the first, and then we have two daughters following that. And by the way, this coming October the 2nd, we'll celebrate our 60th wedding anniversary. So uh, that's uh, quite a milestone for us. 60 years is a long time. It is a long time, it, but I know it's been a good one for you. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us uh, about your military or about your civilian life or about your family? The only thing that I would say, Ted, and maybe I've said this before, but I really appreciate the experiences I had in the military. They were reasonably good. Brag too much about the platoon that I have. These were good men, uh, and they, they functioned very well. But uh, I think it gave me an opportunity, as, as I said earlier, you, one thing the military does, it thrusts responsibility on you quickly. And you either or you don't. And so consequently, I think that uh, the experience that I had in managing these people and managing these men probably was an outstanding thing and probably experience that I needed very much. You mentioned that you are celebrating your 60th a wedding anniversary this year. Is there anything special that you have coming up that we could use in closing here? Well, we're going to have a celebration. In fact, it is uh, um, August the 23rd, which is very close to us now. We're going to have the family and some close friends, and we're going to celebrate <clears throat> at that time, primarily because we want to stay clear of the football season that's coming up. And we thought if we wait until October, uh, we it to probably wouldn't work well, so we're going to celebrate now, and that's going to be uh, that's going to be close to us, and we'll we'll have a good time. Well, thank you, Bill, for sharing your experiences with us. It's certainly been interesting to me, and and I know your family will enjoy it. Okay, that's it. How long? Did we miss anything that you wanted? Can you think of anything? No, I think I dragged it in if I didn't. <laughs> well, you did all right. Your questions were well put, Ted.